sticky note on that one. Welcome, everybody. Go ahead and have a seat if you don't mind, and we'll get started. Thank you for showing up today. Okay, thank you everyone for coming to the Women Empowering Student Success Panel. Our wonderful alumni panelists will share with you their tips to success in college and how they apply to your future career. We would like to thank our deans and all the faculty and staff that are here to support our students for attending the panel and all they do to further diversity initiatives in the College of Aviation. First panel will introduce is Dawn Cook. Dawn Cook graduated with an aeronautical science degree in 2002 and began teaching. Her first job flying a jet was with the PSA was with PSA Airlines in 2004. She continued her career at Spirit Airlines and then in 2007 she began flying for Delta, where she is now a first officer on the Airbus 320 fleet. When she moved to Atlanta, she was able to become more involved with the Delta Mentor Program and became a lead mentor and trainer. She also became an instructor pilot on the Airbus. Outside of flying, Dawn is the co-founder and president of Female Aviators Sticking Together, a nonprofit that is on a mission to change the face of aviation by elevating, encouraging, and empowering female pilots. Dawn is also a certified life coach and wrote an aviation-themed book about life coaching called The Aviatrix Mindset, Stop Stalling and Start Soaring in Every Aspect of Life, which is now a bestseller. Next up, we have Myra. Malik Meyer graduated from Embry-Riddle with a Bachelor of Science in Unmanned Aircraft System Science in 2017. While at Embry-Riddle, she also earned her private pilot license fixed wing. She was an intern at Textron Aviation and returned there after graduation to work as a dispatcher for international operations. After being a dispatcher for a while, Myra transferred to Textron Systems, where she was an instructor and evaluator for Aerosond. She was also deployed to Afghanistan and set up new contract sites for Textron and became a maintenance lead at one of those sites. After working at Textron, she moved to Zipline International, where she became the lead evaluator for their Part 135 operations. After that, she moved back to Florida and took a position as a UAS simulation and flight instructor for the Penguin Sea here at Embry-Riddle. Today, Myra is an instructor in our UAS program while earning her master's degree in information systems. Next up, we have Makita Dawson. Makita is our most recent graduate, having completed her Bachelor of Science in Aeronautics in 2021. She is a CFI and involved in the Republic and JetBlue Pathway programs. Makita is a native of St. John and caught the flying bug in third grade and has been working towards becoming an airline pilot ever since. Makita was an intern with Procter & Gamble's Global Flight Operations as well as Delta Airlines Flight Operations during her time at Embry-Riddle. Her firsthand experience of both the airline and corporate world has given her an understanding of the day-to-day -day operations at an airline and a large corporate flight department. Makita is also a member of Sisters of the Skies, an organization comprised of professional black female pilots who represent 0.02% of the total professional pilot career field. And next up we have Lindsay. 
Lindsay graduated from Embry-Riddle in 2017 which, with a Bachelor of Science in Aviation Maintenance Science. In 2021, she completed her master's degree at Embry-Riddle Worldwide in Aviation Maintenance Management. Lindsay is an aircraft technician and Gulfstream 550 crew chief for Amway in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She has been with the flight department for five years, maintaining a fleet of G550s, CJ4s, Praetor 660s, and an S76 C++. She is an A&P IA FCC Grawl and holds a NCAT AET license. Outside of work, she leads the early education subgroup of the environmental sub of the MBAA maintenance workforce development subcommittee and sits on the MBAA environmental subcommittee. She also teaches part time at the School of Missionary Aviation Technology to share her love of aviation and help inspire the next generation of aircraft technicians. All right. And our last panelist today is Jayla Jackson. Jayla Jackson graduated from Embry-Riddle in 2020 with a Bachelor of Science in Aeronautical Science and is a first officer for Endeavor Air based in Detroit, flying the CRJ 700-900 series jet. She also completed her MBA with a specialization in finance at Embry-Riddle. While a student, Jayla was a student athlete competing on the softball team and flight instructed full-time at Embry-Riddle before continuing on to Endeavor. She belongs to Sisters of the Skies, where she is a mentor to other female pilots of color. Her future plans include becoming a chief pilot for a major airline. And our moderator, Michelle Halloran. Uh, Professor Michelle Halloran is the Director of Diversity Initiatives in the College of Aviation and a professor in the Aeronautical Science Department. She holds a Master of Science in Aeronautics and a Master of Business Administration, an airline transport pilot with over 5,000 total flight hours and 15 years of civilian flying experience. She has been involved in almost every aspect of civilian aviation. Professor Halloran has experience in flight instruction, cargo flight operations in a DC-3, commuter flight operations in a Twin Otter, both land and sea, corporate flight operations in a Learjet, and airline flight operations in the DC-10. Professor Halloran's incredible flying career landed her in a Smithsonian exhibit and book titled Women and Flight. And she has been working very hard on these events all week, so. All right, that's enough of me. I'll pass it over to her and we'll get started. Thank you, Amanda. Can everybody hear okay? All right, excellent, thank you. Um, what an amazing panel we have today. And I wanna extend my thank you and gratitude for everyone coming in here uh, this afternoon. And thank you all very much for um, watching our panel today. Our panel is focused today on student success. And these lovely women are gonna come here and talk to us about how they made it through college. What types of advice can we give our students here to make your life decisions much better, more more informed, and hopefully you'll have even a better career. Um, you can see just from our um, our introductions here that these women are extremely accomplished in their own rights. So I'll start the panel um, for a question for everyone, and I'll start with Jayla, and we'll just kind of work our way here, and we'll kind of go back and forth for a bit. Um, and then at the end of our panel, we'll also, too, please be thinking of any questions you have as well, too. So this is an interactive panel. It's not just us up here talking at you. We want involvement. We want questions at the end as well. All right, so um, Jayla will start. What was there, your initial spark that led you to pursue a career in aviation? Okay, can you guys hear me? Okay, awesome. Um, well, thank you, Michelle, for inviting me to this. Um, I feel like I was a pretty late bloomer in terms of getting into aviation. Um, my first kind of experience or what kind of started it is I was, uh, my uncle works for Ford. And if you don't know, many um, engineers go over and do a international program where they go and they go to China or they go to, you know, the UK or somewhere and they do different events and, and work on different projects. So he was in China for this one and he invited me to go just to go see it. And when I was going, I got to go on this aircraft and I wish I remember, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not that much of an aviation nerd, but um, it was the most amazing experience I've ever had. And I, I was just awestruck from the moment I got on the plane to the moment I landed. And from there, I knew I wanted to do it. So that's really what sparked my interest in aviation. Thank you. All right, Lindsay, next. So mine, just like kind of any other kid growing up, uh, kind of wanted to be an astronaut. And then I grew up, realized, all right, that's not going to happen. So let's pick something else. 
And um, I looked, I was actually at the time when I was in high school, a sophomore, junior, uh, I was thinking about becoming a band director, very involved in music, still play bassoon. And I was like, ah, you know, that just seems like a boring career to go into. Really don't kind of want to do that. Um, and so I took uh, my first flight, it was a commercial flight. Um, I was like, oh, that's pretty sweet. I can do something. You know what? There's so many other careers in aviation other than being an astronaut. Why didn't I think <laughs> of something else? Um, so I kind of went back and forth, thought about flying, had a math teacher try to convince me to go aerospace engineering. I said, nope, don't want to get stuck in a cubicle. It's not my life. Uh, and so my dad, I had a friend, him and, and my dad used to be, you know, really into fixing forklifts and ATVs and stuff like that. And I always enjoyed watching them and hanging out with them. And so I said, you know, this, this is, this is what I'm going to do. Awesome. Thank you. Makita. Um, so this is actually a great question. I love getting asked this question. Um, I don't really remember exactly what got me into aviation. I was really, really young. Um, I do remember, I think my first flight was a flight to um, Virginia, and I used to travel a lot with my grandma when I was little. So I think um, I vaguely remember being in Charlotte Airport, and it was so mesmerizing and cool coming from a little island, going to this big airport. Um, and since like third grade, I just knew I wanted to be a pilot. My island, I'm from a little island in the um, Caribbean called St. John, does not have an airport on the island. Um, so it's really where I don't really remember, but I just grew up knowing I wanted to be a pilot. In eighth grade is when I found Embry-Riddle. So from eighth grade, I was like, okay, I know I'm going to go to Embry-Riddle. Um, and then I just came here and I just, I just wanted to fly. Thank you. Awesome. Myra. Um, so my, mine actually started off having nothing to do with aviation. Um, when I was little, I actually wanted to join the Peace Corps and my mom was adamant about me becoming a doctor. And I was like, what can I do? That's not being a doctor to help like the Peace Corps to help people. And so I just randomly picked, I was like, I'm going to fly deliveries and cargo and stuff like that out there. And then as I started getting older and actually, you know, learning about aviation and learning more about, you know, the different opportunities um, in order to help people and everything. So that's kind of where, like, I got my spark that I was just like, wow, I actually really, I know I randomly picked it, but I actually like really started to get into it. And then later on learning more about like um, different UAS companies that are currently like, you know, already helping people. I ended up working at zip line, you know, which is essentially what I always wanted, you know, we were delivering blood and medical supplies to hospitals in Rwanda and everything. So that's kind of the weird turn it took for me to, you know, fall in love with aviation. Fantastic. Thank you. Dawn? Well, first, thank you again for having all of us and thank you all for your time today. Uh, my name is Dawn Cook and how I started and got to this campus, I was very fortunate. My mother was a flight attendant, so I grew up in the DC area and there was this airline called US Air, which none of you probably know now, that's okay. And she was a flight attendant and she would fly the New York shuttle. So we'd fly from DC to New York, we'd have you know Boston to New York and back and forth. So in the summertime, I would go to work with my mom and I would just have breakfast in New York and come back and lunch in Boston and come back and I thought, I'm going to be a flight attendant. This is amazing. And she's like, absolutely not. So I'm like, how am I going to get paid to fly around the world and, you know, have lunch and travel and do this? She's like, I saw one female pilot. You can do that. I was like, really? She's like, well, if you see one, there's obviously more. And that's just the mindset my mom had. So from there, every time I went to work with her, and this is before the internet and all that fun stuff, I would just ask the pilots, well, you know, can you show me a walk around? Or can you, what can I do? And they would take me on the walk arounds. This is before security was ramped up and you just went on the employee van. And she said, hey, my kids are coming to work with me and save these two seats. And so me and my younger sister would just go work with her in the summer. And I just thought it was fantastic. And when I found out that not only could I do this for the rest of my life, but I could travel beyond DC and Boston. I was like, oh, I'm in, we'll figure it out, I'm in. Awesome, thank you. Um, so pretty relatable, right? Everybody kind of has a different story, but very much so probably a lot of people in here can relate to uh, either being a late bloomer or going uh, from you know knee high to grasshopper, this hot, you wanted to be a pilot or a mechanic or some kind of uh, engineer or something to work on airplanes. Um, so the next question I wanna ask again, we'll start uh, this time with Dawn and we're gonna kind of work our way this way. Um, and 
I want to talk a little bit more about um, how are your resources and who do you use um, and when you make a big decision and such like that. So my question is, when making big decisions, who do you turn to and what tools do you use when you're making the decision making process? Because I know a lot of people in here as students, you're making decisions constantly trying to figure out exactly where to go in your career and how to succeed and how to be able to um, jumpstart your career, right? And how to use the resources at college. So again, big decisions, who do you turn to and what tools do you use in making your decision-making process? Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, where I am in my career, I've been at Delta almost 16 years and fairly senior on my fleet. So big decisions include you know, changing aircraft, upgrading a captain, different things like that, that affect my life, my children, my spouse. And so when it comes to big decisions, honestly, I'm very fortunate. My husband is a captain at United, so he gets the industry, he understands, and I try to go to the source, meaning, okay, I'm gonna upgrade to captain. I'm gonna talk to other captains. I wanna talk to other moms that are captains. I wanna talk to other people that I would understand their pathway. So I try to go to the source versus the rumor mill. I know Google is out there and you can, Insta book face, whatever you want. But the point is, it's almost too much information. And sometimes when you're trying to make a decision, you need something that's exact for your time and what you're dealing with. So I try to go to the source. And then I also reach out as far as people that I can connect with. Who are the other women that I can connect with? Who are the other moms? Who are the other people that have been at my company at a decent time? What bases are you at? What does your lifestyle look like? And then I make that decision and kind of sit with this a little bit. Is this something that I really want to do? And that's come up quite a bit. Um, my big decision that I've had to work with lately is do I upgrade to captain? That's a huge decision. It looks great on paper. It's more money. It's more responsibility but it's horrible for my life. I would be on reserve, I'd be on call. And that just doesn't fit well with how our girls are. I have two children, they're seven and nine. Our girls activities, my family work-life balance. And so those are things that you'll have to deal with later. And when it comes to your career, again, go to the source. Who are people that you know in the industry that were just hired at Endeavor or just hired as instructors or just hired at maybe a company that you wanna to go to? It doesn't seem like it, this industry is very small. You can find somebody at a place where you're at and you can ask them questions and we're all more than willing to help because we've all climbed up and we do want to reach down. Awesome, thank you. Myra, big decisions. Yes, um, for my aviation related decisions, um, unfortunately during my career, I haven't actually gotten to work with a lot of other women. Um, but I, when I was working at uh, Textron Aviation, I did have one woman who I, uh, I forced her to be my mentor, essentially. <laughs> she had been in the industry for 40 plus years. She had seen the whole, you know, ups and downs of aviation, been laid off about two or three different times throughout, you know, the industry's ups and downs. And so I kind of forced her to be my mentor. And so every like step I take, I kind of ask her, you know, based off her experience in aviation or, you know, just things that she's known in life. Like I kind of go to her. She's like who I rely on a lot of the time for any advice. Um, and then just outside of aviation, um, for any of my big moves, I've moved around a lot, uh, with my career. So with a lot of my big moves and everything, I like look to my family and ask them, you know, should I make this big move? Should I do this career change or a job change as opposed to a career change and everything? So I just kind of have to have like everyone in, that's already in my corner, just kind of go to them and ask them like, you know, what should I do in this situation? And then I weigh my own pros and cons and everything. I don't, don't use Google or anything either. So. <laughs> That's too much. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Makita, what do you think? Um, so I would say in this stage of my life, uh, big decisions will probably be um, figuring out in terms of, I'm still doing flight training. Um, so I'm working on CFAA right now, but I had to make a decision um, when I just finished CFI, I did it at a part 61 school back in Orlando because I currently live in Orlando. So I was trying to make that decision of should I come back to Riddle and do CFI at Riddle and have to drive an hour or should I just um, try this new school in Orlando and um, whether it be aviation or personal, I really consult my my friend group who comprises of uh, pilots. <laughs> uh, we're all pilots, so we all go through the same things. Um, most of my friends are a little bit ahead of me, so they've probably been in that step before and I can ask them, um, what do you think? Um, what advice do you have? Um, also, as mentioned in my bio, I'm a part of Sisters of the Skies and that's comprised of black professional um, female pilots. So um, they you know, went through the same things that I went through to be at um, airlines. So I'll consult with them as well, um, my specific mentors. But I feel like in terms of student success, you can also look towards your professors. So 
um, and maybe in terms of classes, but maybe stuff outside of school specifically, you can ask your professors, you know, they're, uh, they're there to help you. They have a ton of knowledge and you can go to them just as much as you can go to your friends and um, maybe not the internet, but yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. Tools and decision-making for you, please. Yeah, you guys have all had uh, really great answers with everything with that. And, um, you know, even on the, on the professor front, um, I had someone tell me a long time ago that there's something that uh, I believe it's actually Mr. Drossi right there. There's something you can uh, gain from, from everybody that you come across, whether that's the right way to do something or the wrong way to do something. Um, so regardless of who you come in contact with your life, you know, whatever it may be, uh, personal work related, absorb it like a sponge, um, and really, really take the time when you do get into a position where you need to make a big decision to think about that. Um, I've been fortunate to have some senior guys that I work with that are really awesome. They've been in the industry for years. Um, so there's some things that, you know, I'll go to them and kind of talk it over with them and, um, I fall back on my family. Um, my faith, you know, sometimes you just really kind of, you give it to God, uh, pray about it. Um, and then also, you know, it's kind of like the, the old saying, if you're mad at someone, you know, send an email or write an email out and then save it and then go back maybe the next day and look at it, and, you know, see if you really feel the same way about it. Uh, kind of do the same thing, with pros and cons, you know, write down positive and negatives on it and then really kind of let it sit for a week or so go back and be like, all right, am I really making a, a rational decision or jumping the gun on this? Or should I just kind of wait it out and see where the tide goes? Um, so there's definitely, a, you know, many different ways to skin a cat. Very much so. Thank you. <laughs> Jayla? Well, this is something that I've struggled with a lot because I am notoriously indecisive to the point where it takes me 20 minutes just to pick out what pants I'm going to wear in the morning. So um, for me, the biggest thing, and they'll, they'll really beat this into you in initial training, is to expand your team. So similar to what the other lady said, but, you know, the first thing I do is I go to my parents. And, of course, any decision, they're going to say, like, you know, whatever more money you're going to make or the most money so I can move to Florida. I'm like, okay, you guys are useless. <laughs> um, and then I, you know, go to my significant other or I go to the mentors or somebody who knows the insight. Because typically, like Don said, Google is cool, but it doesn't tell you, hey, you're going to be sitting reserved for the next six months or you're going to be doing this. So really expanding your team and getting an inside information to help you make that decision. Awesome. Thank you. So are you getting kind of the idea that you want mentors right in your in your life? You need people that are going to help you, whether that's in your family or people that come ahead of you in your career and such like that, that you can use as mentors. Um, that's very key. So thank you all for that. Um, all right. So this next question, we'll start in the middle with Makeda and I'll just kind of flip it a little bit. All right. Um, so what pitfalls or challenges have you encountered in your career and what resources have you used to overcome them? Great question. So biggest pitfall is definitely during flight training. <laughs> um, I would say, so I was um, doing my commercial single hair at Riddle. Um, I knocked it out in about two semesters. So I finished everything. I got to the end took a trip, came back, it was time to do my DE and it was like 4th of July week and none of the DEs wanted to be scheduled. So I didn't end up getting my DE done. I ran out of the 60 days and after the 60 days, if you don't do your check ride, then you have to re-enroll in a course and go back through training of three flight hours and la, 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 spend more money. I didn't have any more money. Um, so I was like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I, I want to finish CF, I want to finish commercial, go to CFI, like, you know, everyone around me, all of my friends are, you know, doing CFI and we're, you know, we want to move on to airlines. So, um, I, I ended up getting an internship during that time, but, um, eventually ended up having to save my own money and, um, like put myself back into commercial training and finished that up last spring. So that was a big pitfall for me. I didn't fly for 17 months and, you know, you're a pilot, you're going through withdrawals, I miss flying and how am I going to pay for that? Um, so that was one example. And I would say another example would be me starting CFI training. So I recently finished up my CFI. Uh, like I said, I did it at a part 61 school in Orlando, which is a very big change for me because I did all my training at Riddle. I'm only used to G1000s and 141 structure. So it was a really big challenge for me um, doing a part 61 and doing CFI training. You know, everyone's always saying CFI training is so hard, la, la, la. 
And um, it was really hard for me at first, you know, struggling with confidence to get through training. It was really hard to find time to study. I was working full time. Um, I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I could get through it. Um, so finding comfort within my friends and talking to them who have been through um, CFI training and were CFIs and um, consulting with my sisters who are really like my best friends as well and talking to them throughout the training that helped me a lot. So definitely using my support system during flight training helps a ton. And today you're a CFI. Yes, I'm a CFI, which is okay. so crazy right. to say Excellent. still. <laughs> All right, Myra, what about you, dear? Um, pitfalls and uh, resources to overcome them. Yeah. Um, so one of the biggest, uh, like, I guess, challenge I had was um, when I started working at Textron Systems with the Arison program. This was in 2018, and I was the first woman they had hired in the training department. And it was just a bunch of weird little things that I had to kind of force and remind them to, like, help me actually be a part of the team. Um, so just a couple examples. Um, we had to use, we had to order all of our parts and inventory and things like that through um, an internal system. And, you know, to use, to handle the fuel or oil or anything, you had to use latex gloves, you know, you could only order large and extra large gloves. And I had to like tell them, I was like, I can't like, I can't, you're not providing the proper like safety equipment for myself to like function in this role. And then like another thing is, um, I'm not the tallest person. I'm five feet tall on a good day. Um, everything was above my reach. <laughs> so they had to order me a step stool just to like do like work in the hangar and do maintenance. It was just like a bunch of little things. They had to change the entire uniform because all of the uniform, all they ever had were men. So they ordered all 5'11", like men stuff and they don't make anything in my size. <laughs> so they as, after they hired me, they had to, it took them like months to actually order me a uniform because they had to find a whole different uniform just to like accommodate me. So it was just like a bunch of little things that I had to keep reminding them like, you know, hey, you're forgetting about me in the team, you know, cause they were only used to like only having men. I mean, the bright side, I had my own private bathroom, but <laughs> other than that. <laughs> yeah, that could be a little intimidating. Yes. I know for the first two airline jobs I had, I actually had to uh, order, because this was all they had, men's uniforms, pilot uniforms. And, you know, they're not fitted right through here. So you're like, okay, it looks like a sack, but I'm in uniform. So what do you do? All right. Next, we'll go with Jayla. Um, pitfalls and resources, please. Yeah, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but uh, my pitfall recently was just landing the CRJ. Um, and whether I was creating holes in the runway or I was going off the end of the Hudson, I could not figure it out for the longest. Um, and it was so frustrating doing the same thing over and over again. And most of you who are pilots know that landing is about 30 seconds, right? You have 30 seconds to get it right or you mess it up. Um, and for me, you know, used to being from Riddle, trying to do everything perfect, trying to be, you know, the best pilot I can be, that was so frustrating. So really what I did is one, remind myself, hey, you're not a, you're not perfect, you're a person and then you're a pilot. And the second thing is that I just talked to my family and, and really got some encouragement and support and that really helped me. Great, thank you. Lindsay? Yeah, so mine was, I was very fortunate to uh, hire on with Amway uh, straight out of college. Um, so I got a little pushback on the, uh, experience factor coming into there. And so it doesn't matter what school, university, college program, what you go to, um, uh, you're always going to be tested a little bit, kind of see what you're made of. Um, so, but no, I had, I mean, I had a great experience with, with the guys, with the team that I, that I worked with. And, um, I, I definitely would say, um, coming out of college, you really have to be careful, um, what you say and how you come across on a respect level. Um, Cause you know, as the generations kind of move technology changes and everything, and, and some of the kind of older guys um, don't, don't necessarily want to move with it. Um, and then same thing with, with some guys you take, for instance, some people like electrical avionic stuff and some people don't. Um, so it was interesting with me having the ALM minor. Um, I had a very good understanding. Uh, I mean, already even not knowing the kind of the, elite cockpit, you know, Gulfstream system, but just knowing how it already kind of operated because, you know, most of them are all the same and coming in and, and knowing how to do something, but not necessarily, you almost had a, you had to bite your tongue 
because you didn't want to, you know, offend someone or make them feel bad that you might have known, you know, something. Um, so that was that was a working process of kind of. I found hopefully they don't listen to this, but uh, it kind of had to use a little bit of reverse psychology um, in a sense of of kind of being like, hey, you know, can you can you show me how to do this? And then, you know, go through that process and then be like, well, what if you did it this way? You know, like, have you considered doing it this way? And kind of going around about that way, really being smart about it. Um, so I, I'd say that's probably probably the biggest um, advice I'd have to say is, is definitely respect people that are already in the industry. Don't be afraid to stand up for yourself, too, at the same time. They might not be doing something the, the right and proper way because you're going to run into that. Um, no doubt. I promise you that. Um, so just be uh, very careful how you do it. Um, and then personality. So the relationships that you have at work. I mean, you spend a good portion of your life at work. Um, so it's important to, to form those coworker relationships because even that um, can make or break your career, whether or not you're going to love your job, whether or not you're going to go in um, every day hating it. So uh, definitely make a point to kind of get to know everyone. Everyone has a different personality and you take some time. Sometimes you have to kind of be a little... Some people have a smart sense of sarcasm and you got to kind of get on their level and other times you got to rein back. And so it's, uh, I kind of enjoy it. It's kind of fun figuring out everyone's personality and working with them and, you know, being respectful while you do it. It's almost like you need a minor in psychology, right? Have you noticed that? How many CFIs in here? Raise your hand. Okay. So three, four. Okay. All right. So um, CFIs, right? Certified flight instructors, you have to take a course in fundamentals of instruction and it's like psychology 101, right? And it kind of teaches you how to communicate and teach, say lift five different ways because everybody learns different ways and such like that. So very good points there. Relationships are everything. That'll make a break right? your career for the long run. Exactly. All right. Thank you. All right, Dawn, uh, pitfalls and tools to overcome them, please. Okay. Pitfalls. One thing I will say I was not prepared for, and it's just life. You can't get a rule book on all this as when I was first hired at Delta. So I flight instructed, I flew cargo for a bit. I flew RJs for PSA spirit and I'm getting to Delta and I'm, I'm all unicorns and glitter. I'm like, this is amazing. I am here. Let's do this. I want to high five everybody and give them hugs. And I get in that flight deck and it's this old school you know, captain that wants to know, how did I get here? Questioning everything I do, asking me questions if it's a check ride. And at first it, it was a huge pitfall because I'm thinking I got through all the training. I passed all the check rides, yet I'm getting the third degree question on everything. And what are you doing here? Almost as if I had to prove myself. And I'd go home and I'm like, I'd tell my husband, I'm like, I'm just going to print my resume out and just slide it over to him. Like, this is, this is how I got here. If you have any other questions, you let me know. So the resources I used and I'm a, I'm a pretty headstrong person and I'm, I'm trying to be respectful. And I, you know, I'm just like, what can I do? And it's just use your books, know your stuff. And so I used exactly what my company gave me. So when you have questions, I'll give you the exact tire pressure and I'll tell you the page it's on in the paragraph. So if you'd like any other information, you keep me posted. And so I went back at them with information. You can't doubt me when I know just as much as you, or maybe even more, because I had to dig in there because it got old having to prove myself over and over again. They're slowly fading out, but that's just one thing I was not expecting. I'm just, I'm happy to, like, this is amazing. I, I did it. All that riddle work, it finally paid off. And yet here's this person here saying, maybe not yet. And I just wasn't going to give them that power. Awesome. Thank you. All right. How many UAS students do we have in here? Raise your hand. Okay, this is going to be a short question. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so for Myra, actually, right, she's our only female instructor in the UAS program. And anybody minoring in UAS, you know, it's a good backup if you lose your medical, right? Just throwing that out there. Okay. All right. Thanks, Stacy. Okay. So then let's do this question for Myra. What opportunities in the growing, okay, UAS industry will be available to students, you think, in the next five years? Yeah, that's a really good question. And then um, for any of you who aren't UAS majors, but have your PPL or anything like that, that's going to be really helpful in the future for UAS too. Um, most of the domestic 
like companies, industries like Zipline, Matternet, Wing, Flytrex, they're all moving towards 135 operations. Uh, that's the, they're kind of starting to go away from 107. Um, since 107 is more like anyone, real estate people can go get a license, do their own like real estate photography. Um, so the industry is moving towards 135. So they are looking for a lot of people who already have their pilot's licenses. Um, in case you don't want to keep going through CFI and all of that. <laughs> um, but it's going to be a lot of that. So there's a lot of operator stuff. There's a lot of GIS stuff in all of those industries as well. And then um, for non-domestic, more DOD side, there's so many jobs for the DOD side. That's also growing and growing and growing. Um, if you want to, you know, go, I went overseas for three months and paid off my student loans just to say that. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of opportunities like that as well to, you know, if you want to start getting into the industry, we have a lot of maintainers, we have a lot of mandated pilots as well who do get into that field um, because they just enjoy it more or sometimes, you know, they do want to come home every night to their families and things like that. So you go in, you know, do the job and come home as well as opposed to like airlines and everything. So there's a bunch of different opportunities for the DOD side, for contractor sides, for 135 and everything everything. And they are looking for people other than just UAS as well. So there's opportunities for everyone, GIS, maintenance, and pilots. Awesome. Thank you. Plan B, right? Um, you do realize, okay, raise your hand for pilots. Okay, about half the room. Okay, maintenance, raise your hand. Thank you. Maintenance in the house. All right, good. Yeah. Okay, so we'll have a maintenance question here in a moment too. But as far as pilots, plan B, right? You got a lot of time off, just so you know. You probably are going to be flying for a couple of weeks out of the month. You could always do something with the drones and something with um, the uh, UAS industry. Just throwing that out there as a backup, right? And okay. just to add into that, since you, uh, since there's a lot of maintainers, like I said, a lot of the domestic companies are looking for AMPs for their maintenance for their UAS as well, so. Excellent, all right. You Zip didn't know hiring. get the job offer, did they, did you? Okay, cool. Zipline's hiring AMPs, so. Excellent. <laughs> You're all looking for jobs. Thank you. All right, so this is a question specifically for Makita. Um, you just graduated a year ago, right? Were there any specific classes that you took here at Riddle that impacted your career and um, that put you on a trajectory or made a big difference in your career? Great question. Or professors. <laughs> or oh, any experience that you professors. had that helped you. Yeah. Um, let me think. So I, I do remember, which class was that? Professor Hardford. Okay. I do remember which class it was. Yep. Um, he was a retired airline pilot, amazing, amazing guy. Uh, he would bring, what I love about, the one thing I love going to college was the guest speakers. So bringing in pilots to talk to us because, you know, we're pilots, we're, we want to be where they're at. So uh, I remember him doing that a lot. I really like the um, airline operations class that gave you a really in-depth view of the airline ops. Um, I also really like doing the, um, I think it was 412, which is like the capstone senior class. Um, that was nice. You were able to do um, presentations on different companies. So everyone did a different company. Um, and that was nice learning about all the different opportunities. Um, honestly, just like my 121 ground class, you know, that was really like first class on aviation coming into Embry-Riddle as a freshman and you're so excited to be flying airplanes and learning about airplanes and everyone around you is just excited as you are. So being in that class and kind of getting your first taste of what the like pilot life is like and talking to a professor um, and he was a former military and I just really like the professors, honestly. They're all so um, super sweet. Professor Rigby, like still up to this day, I reach out to him. Um, he was um, aerodynamics or aircraft performance um, professor, but amazing, amazing guy. Um, yeah, my riddle experience truly it means it means a lot. And I think um, when I did my internship at Delta, being able to recall even at Procter and Gamble, especially when I did my Procter and Gamble internship, um, I did the um, the corporate aviation class and that gave you an insight on a corporate aviation operations. And when I got to Procter and Gamble, I was like, oh, I already learned about that. I already learned about that. I know about that. And so it was really cool to learn about it in a classroom and then be in the actual real life setting and apply everything that you learned. And 
being, like I said, in the airline operations class and then going to Delta and seeing um, everything that you learn about in the classroom being applied to actual airline operations is really, really nice. And then um, just the flight training that you get at Riddle being so structured around airline flying and jump seating on a Delta flight and seeing them do, you know, um, in-depth checklists, just like we do here at Riddle and the processes that they use is the same thing that, you know, I did at Riddle. So everything just kind of comes full circle when you see why you learn everything the way you do here so that you can apply it when you do become, when you do accomplish your goal as an airline pilot. Awesome. Thank you. It feels like we're doing kind of a good thing in, in AS as far as teaching and preparing our pilots. So that makes us feel really good. All right. So this next question is for Lindsay. Um, so does anybody have an idea of how many female um, mechanics, maintainers there are in industry? SM all small. Yes, ma'am. What do you think? 2.5. Woohoo. Yeah. 2.5. It's been kind of stagnant at that number, just so you know, for the past few years. We've not had any growth in that area as far as women. So the current uh, percentage of female mechanics and maintainers is 2.5%. What advice, Lindsay, do you have for increasing the percentage of women in aviation maintenance? I think it starts at the elementary, middle school, high school level. I think we're not we're not going back far enough to be able to get people interested in it. I mean, people don't know about it. They don't consider it. You know, there's a lot of stereotypes that are in the industry right now about being a mechanic, a technician. Um, you know, that you look at perfect example. Uh, look at the nursing field with the men in the nursing field. You know, there's only 12% of men in the nursing field. And I actually was looking up the stat um, a couple of weeks ago, 1970s, it was 2%. And so that's yeah. 40, 40, you know, 50 years um, that it took just to get from two to 12. Uh, so now I think, you know, if more people are starting to, to push it and let them know that it's an option, um, I think that's overall the, the issue with mechanics altogether. I think that we need more, especially being on MEAA, the, the workforce development group with early education. We just started developing presentations to where um, we can take volunteers and, and put them in, in middle schools and elementary schools and say, hey, this is all the, all the careers that you can do in aviation. Um, because we're, we're doing a lot of talking about it, but there's not a lot of boots on the ground. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, is spreading the word. Awesome, thank you. Jayla, this is kind of the same question for you as well. Um, and uh, this is a surprise question for Jayla. So thinking on your feet, you're, you're good. Um, but how do we increase, there's 4.6% female airline transport pilots in the US. And again, both of these numbers, the 2.5 and the 4.6, it's kind of a flat line, right? Um, in the medical field, right? Flat line, you're dead. Uh, that's pretty much what it's been like for the, for the last 50 years. It's very incrementally, incredibly small percentages going up and it looks literally like a longitudinal flat line going across. Um, but we're currently ATPs at 4.6%. Is there anything that you can add to Lindsay's advice as far as starting early? Um, anything to broaden our horizons and pick up that number at 4.6 in the pilot world? Um, I think Lindsay hit it right on the head. I think it really starts at the, the younger levels. I mean, you know, you talk to kindergartners and, and middle schoolers and you say like, hey, what do you want to be? And typically women say, you know, fashion designer, nurses, I want to be the, the same five things. Um, and then you, when I talk to so many flight attendants, they tell me, hey, I didn't even know this was an option for women. I didn't even know we did this really until I saw you. So it's really showing that, yes, we do it and we can do it and we have been doing it. So I, I agree with her 100%. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, next question is going to be for Dawn. And um, I want to know about your influences throughout your career and um, what led you to fly for Delta and why did you start fast? I know it's kind of a three part question there. <laughs> I know. Right. We'll just bombard her with all these questions at the same time. Right. Um, so influences, uh, it honestly started with my mom. I'm, I'm very fortunate. She's an incredible woman, but I was just raised on the concept of you don't know what you can't do if you don't try. And so can't was almost like a four letter word in our house. You don't say that. You can always figure it out. And so her saying, hey, I, I went to work and saw another female pilot. We can figure it out. I was like, okay. 
um, other influencers were just people that, that said yes. Hey, can I do a walk around with you? Yeah, sure. That captain or pilot could have said no. You know, they could have done their own thing, but they took the time to just spend the time and plant that seed with a young person that was just curious. So from there, I have gained a lot of mentors. Um, in the summer, I would volunteer at a flight camp with the Black Pilots of America. And Captain Les Morris was the first African-American uh, chief pilot ever. And he flew for Eastern and he took me under his wing. And all he asked was that I pay it forward. And just, you're you're gonna do great. You're gonna go to Riddle. You're gonna you know check the boxes, but pay it forward as you go through life. And I've kind of stuck with that. And what drew me to Delta, honestly, was the opportunity. So I graduated just after 9-11. No one was hiring and my degree's in pilot. I was like, that's not a good idea, but it worked out. And so from there, I was kind of thinking, you know, what, what do I do? And so when I saw the opportunity at Delta, um, US Air is a good company, but that was my mom's one rule. You cannot work for US Air. So I figured, okay, I got to find somebody else. But um, they were on the East Coast. They had a really great international presence and they had options. There are other airlines out there to where they do fly one type and I, I wanted something else. I knew after, you know, I flew one type of aircraft, I'd like to do a wide body. I'd like to cross the country. I'd like to go across the pond and they had options. And so, and your third part of your question was fast. So a quick background for all of you. Um, FAST stands for Female Aviators Sticking Together, and I'm the co-founder of this nonprofit, and really it was just a way to collectively bring female pilots together to talk about everything from uh, having babies, postpartum depression, coming back after cancer. We just didn't really have a space for that, and so a few of my fellow co-workers, we created this space, and what we thought would be a couple hundred people that we know turned into 13,200 women worldwide. And we're all female pilots and we come together for summits and we have scholarships, mentor programs, ambassador programs, but we came together because there was just this void. There are other groups out there that support women, but no one that is just tailored to female pilots. And we really pride ourselves on having that small niche and that small bit of empowerment to start raising those numbers. And one of the things that we're doing, kind of what Lindsay said, is, you know, I've sat in on meetings and it's, it's a lot of talk. We need more women. Yay, we need more women, your turn. We need more women, you turn. So everybody says these things, but no one's really doing them. So collectively, we kind of got together and thought, what can we do? And we're actually starting discovery flights to where you're a parent. You don't know how to get from A to B. Discovery flights are a way to plant that seed and our nonprofit will pay for it. You just sign up, here are the schools, here are people you can work with and we'll foot the bill. But you've got to understand that that potential, that creating and cultivating that possibility, it starts at such a younger age. And I feel like even that stigma of, oh, let's go to the high schools. That's great. All high schoolers would love to hear about every riddle, but that five-year-old, they need to know it's a possibility. They need to know it's an option. And like you said, they see the same thing over again. I want to be Beyonce. That's great because that's what you see. You don't see, you know, the female a &P. You don't see the woman of color walking around the airport. You just don't see these. We don't even see the mechanics half the time because you're in your own little, you know, silo, so it seems. So they don't know these things are possible because they just don't see it. And so just starting to take action and FAST has grown to be a wonderful community that we're doers. We're done talking. We're going to start doing. And Delta has been a great place to hang my hat. I'll be there for the next, I'm not telling you how old I am, the next couple of years, I'll hang out there for a while and uh, start crossing the pond and, you know, just be able to pay it forward. I've climbed up and I'll do my best to reach down. Thank you very much. Sankin? Oh, oh, okay. Um, so we're going to open up now for questions um, from the audience. Anybody have questions? want to know anything that we haven't covered yet. I still have more questions to go, just so you know, if you're shy, but come on up. I have a question for you, Lindsay. Um, what influenced your decision to pursue maintenance with a corporate operator as opposed to going into general aviation or going with transport category? Awesome question. So when I first started at Riddle, um, all I knew was general aviation or um, airlines. And so at the time, I was actually kind of leaning more towards general aviation um, because I was kind of, uh, I talked to some people that were in the airlines and they had kind of been pigeonholed um, with working on, you know, one or two systems and then they would transfer over to another systems. And um, actually a couple of guys that I, I graduated with are kind of dealing with that right now where they've kind of been hopping from department to department. Um, and so uh, Jim Hontoon came over and gave a scholarship presentation for MBAA, 
and he brought with him some of the mechanics from NASCAR. And so I got to go over there and tour the facility and check it out. And, um, just overall, I, I decided to go the corporate route because you have that nose to tail option, everything in between. Um, at Amway, I can be deep cycling batteries one second, go over, change a tire on a wheel assembly the next hour. And then next thing I know, I'm, I'm, I'm troubleshooting an aircraft that's got thrust reverser issues or has electrical issues. Um, I mean, all in the same day. Um, so that's what I love about it. Uh, I get to do air data certifications as well. I mean, it, there's a lot that if you were in an airline, all of those different things would be done by a different department. Um, so I love that aspect with the corporate side. I also get to go, I mean, I go, I go with the plane to the service centers. Now that I'm a crew chief, you get to oversee all that, oversee all the final, you know, sealant, paint, interior, everything. Um, so that's why I chose the corporate route. Also the, the benefits that are there. Um, Amway has an awesome, you know, retirement 401k plan that they give, um, along with, you know, vacation, sick time, that, that whole package. And, and then we also do flight techs to where you fly with a plane on international trips. So they, they have three pilots that normally they send. And so normally there's only four slots for crew. And so instead of sending a mechanic and a flight attendant, um, you feel the, the flight attendant cap when you're on the airplane, you go through an actual flight attendant school and training and how to do egress and everything. And you serve and serve cocktails and cook food and everything and have your little flight attendant hat on. And then when you get on the ground, uh, you're doing all the maintenance work. You know, I had one trip over to uh, Dubai where I, you know, had a long, it's insane. It was like, I think like 18 hour a day or something like that flying over there. And I get over there and um, I was the only mechanic for four of our airplanes that went over. And so uh, one of them had a nose strut that deflated on me. And so, you know, I just was a flight attendant for a couple of hours and now I'm in my suit still servicing a strut. So, I mean, it's just, you just never know. Every day is different. And uh, that's why I love the, the corporate side. It just comes, you know, like with anything with the airlines, there's, there's a lot more positionings right now. That's, they're what you see on the public sector. And so, you know, they're the most known and that's kind of where we've slacked off a little bit with the business aviation side um, is it, it is, it's a small community, but on top of that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of rich business owners that can, and companies that can afford their own airplanes. And so we've had this kind of stigma to where oh, we didn't really, you know, we don't even tell the whole public that, you know, this company has this many planes and this company has that many planes. We kind of been below the radar and we're realizing that we've hurt ourselves in the process because not a lot of people know about, you know, what you do as a mechanic corporate in a flight department. Um, so we're definitely kind of trying to turn that around and get more people involved and interested in it. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit slower process moving up just because there's not as many positions to fill. Uh, you kind of have to be willing to move, um, but they're, they're there, um, especially service centers right now. Normally you can go one, three years in a service center and then you can get picked up by a flight department. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? As you're coming up here, I've got a question for the audience. Raise your hand if you're interested in corporate aviation. Oh, excellent. The pilots and mechanics. That's a wonderful thing. Um, I know we don't do a great job here at Embry-Riddle um, pushing corporate. Um, we are kind of changing that a little bit. Um, if you notice that the career fairs now are starting to have more and more corporate flight departments and mechanic departments at our um, on our campus. And we've also had several people lately from the corporate flight departments uh, come here and actually try to recruit. So please don't forget about the corporate end of things too as well. Um, yes, ma'am, we your question, please. I don't know. Um, kind of a two-parter, I guess, but I've heard a lot both from both sides that Riddle here can have a tendency to overcomplicate the um, information that you receive from your classes and then actually transferring it over into the workforce or they've been heard to under-prepare you for the workforce as well. So I just wanted to get anyone's opinion basically on what did you take away from here specifically to carry over into your job? And how well do you think it actually helped you carry into your job? Thank you. Uh, anybody for that one? Anyone who wants to take it. Really. Okay. So this is a little bit different. I know the flight program has changed, but one thing that 
what I was very well prepared for is the workload. You go into these airlines, they're not going to spoon feed you. You show up, you need to have done the sims, you need to have done the flight, like the, the computer work, you need to know your flows, you need to go in there and be ready. And you can totally tell the difference. Um, I was a flight instructor at my company on the bus for a while. And I can tell the difference from where people are coming from, even though they're coming from the regionals, that foundation of work ethic and doing your best and knowing how to take on a heavy workload and organize it and balance and still, you know, be successful. That's something that I think they prepare you for. It might seem like a fire hose sometimes or unnecessary, but when you are flying these complex aircrafts, these companies, they're on a schedule. You're not going to get 10 extra sims. You're not going to maybe get two. You need to be ready. And you could see the people that could handle it, manage it. This is what's expected of me done versus, oh, I thought I was just going to show up. No, 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 that's, that's not how we work. So that, that workload, it seems a little overwhelming, maybe depending on what you're doing, but that was, I think, one of the best things to prepare you is over-prepare you. And now, I mean, you, you go to training, it's a breeze. You know what to expect, you know how to handle it versus learning how to handle it, how to organize it, and learn the information at the same time. Thank you. I guess I can piggyback on it. So I recently graduated in 2020. Um, and for me, I felt totally prepared in terms of what Riddle could prepare me for in terms of my classes. Um, so typically when you go to the airlines, we'll do an in-doc, which will be just about their rules and their general procedures, how they got started. And then you'll go to gen subs and start getting into more aircraft specific stuff. So the cool thing about Riddle is when I did gen subs, I didn't really sweat at all because we talk about weather to death, right? I mean, we talk about CRM, we talk about all these so um, subjects that somebody who didn't go to Riddle might not know. So I felt really prepared and you know, it was a good thing that I was a little bored during class for that one part. Um, so I can focus on systems, which, you know, you won't know because it's specific for that company. So personally, I thought I thought um, my classes really helped me through my training. Yeah, I also wanted to add to that. Um, I was I had a friend, uh, he did an internship with me at Delta and he um, was going through um, his first jet job and he was explaining to me um, how his training was going and he was telling me that he was having a really hard time learning the jet and he didn't understand any of the jet systems and, uh, you know, just like the, um, I think it's like the, the jet AC system and stuff like that and I was like, oh, I learned about that at Riddle, I learned about, you know, the how the engine works, I learned about the FMS, learned about all this stuff and I'm like, you didn't learn about that, like you didn't know that. He didn't, you know, he went to, um, I think a school in, um, in Pennsylvania, but being able to, uh, you know, like be like, yeah, I, I probably would have, um, probably found it was a breeze going to that training because I le already learned all of that stuff here in like the jet transport systems class or the FMS class that we did. Um, and also, like I said earlier, uh, when I did the internship at Procter & Gamble, it's a corporate flight operations, and I did the corporate um, flight operations class here at Riddle. So when I got to Procter & Gamble, I remember learning in class that the professor was telling us that they do a lot of flying, but the flying um, is probably like half of the job because you also do a lot of management stuff because the flight operations department is so small. So I got there and I talked to the pilots and they're like, oh yeah, I fly, but I also do like the focus stuff. Oh, I fly, but I'm also like assistant chief and I do a lot of management stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember that from class. Or I remember the professor um, like teaching us about, you know, how a corporate flight department works because they're all different, especially if it's for a corporation or if it's for like a 135 um, operation. And so it definitely, definitely translated from the class into the actual real world operations um, in the flight department. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I know in um, while you're students here, it's kind of hard sometimes when you're totally head down and all you're doing is study, 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 right? And um, how many of you have asked, because I've asked this question, I think we all have, and even as a professor myself, um, why do I need to know this, right? Um, that's the key thing, right? We all talk about that and you're not going to pay attention to anything at all that anybody up here has to say unless it actually applies to you right now. And unfortunately, a lot of your stuff that you're learning is very applicable to your job once you get out, right? So it's just kind of a matter, and I hate to say this about time management, but you're going to store away all this knowledge and then hopefully soon, as soon as you graduate, you're going to be in an environment where you're actually applying all of this knowledge 
knowledge. So it takes a while to kind of gather up all of that knowledge and then figure out if you don't forget it all and then, you know, figure out what all you have to apply. So um, don't give up, don't get upset, you know, trying to learn all this stuff all at once as far as, far as the fire hose. Uh, there will come the application. We all promise you that. And you will have to dig deep into that in your memory banks and go, oh, yeah, okay. Now it all makes sense. This is why we cover that case study or this is why we had to take away that, um, you know, take apart this part of the engine 18 times before we could put it all back together, you know, blindfolded or whatever the case is. But um, so there is a method to the madness, right, from your instructors here. Um, we do a lot with our industry and our industry advisory council, and we are constantly in touch with people that are in industry, such as these wonderful ladies here, but also to, to help us with our curriculum so that you're not learning something just because you're actually learning something. It may not be tomorrow tomorrow, but you're going to be able to apply that knowledge um, in your future job. Anybody else have another question? Go ahead. Hello. Oh, can you read? I think it's on. Is it on? It's not repeating. I'll, I'll repeat. Okay. Well, um, hi. I'm part of the women's mediation group here on campus. And a lot of the things or the topics that have been brought up today, such as corporate aviation, or something that is not necessarily, you know, a woman dominated field, how do you bring up those topics that, you know, you have a right, for example, to have a uniform that fits without coming off in such a way that it just sounds like you're complaining? Did everybody hear Isabella? Pretty much, okay. Basically, as a minority, okay, and if you don't properly have the right tools and such like that, how do you come off and be able to professionally say, you know, what you need? Is that the gist of it? Yeah. Okay, all right. Anybody? Sometimes you just gotta kind of just go up there and do it. And I know mine, it's, it's gonna be funny, maybe not the best appropriate comment, but um, so. My uniforms, like when I got them, I didn't, I didn't really care. I didn't think much of it, but they were guys' pants. And um, you get, you get working, you get going on the ramp or whatever. You get hot and sweaty and everything. And we have a seventy-six helicopter, and you got to climb on top of the road grid. Well, the pants weren't very good. I mean, quality seems to begin with. And um, you kind of get going, and all of a sudden, you know, next thing you know, you hear whoop. I said, oh. <laughs> I'm on top of the helicopter. My pants just ripped. So, you know, it was one of those things where you kind of walk in there and said, you know, I understand you guys have a reasoning of why your pants have a longer seam on the bottom. I said, but can, can I please just get some female pants, you know, my own size. I don't have to deal with this anymore. And it kind of became a little joke after that um, because some of the guys not long after that, because we had just kind of changed into new pants, they ended up having the same scenario happen. So it became kind of a running joke after the fact. But um, yeah, sometimes you just, you know, a lot of them are open to it. It's just whether or not, you know, the management has a lot of other things that they're worried about and they're thinking about and they're trying to keep a, a facility running and operating the way it should be. Um, sometimes it's just not something that that's on the forefront of their mind is whether or not your uniform fits. Um, and so it's just a matter of, you know, going up to them and, and mentioning it. And most of the time they're like, oh yeah, sure thing. Like I didn't even realize that was a problem. Like we'll get right on it, you know? So it's just, um, yeah, just, just, just gotta, just go for it and not make a big deal about it. I think that's the thing that I think some of us, you know, and I mean, there's kind of two types of women in the industry now. I mean, I hopefully I don't offend anyone, but, um, you know, there's those that, that are going to make a big deal about it all the time and, and it seems like the, the female card always gets played and then it, it hurts some of us that don't play you know that that, that aren't that tight um because then you kind of get that perception going and it's like no like this is very simple like i'm not anything of it just you know straightforward with this and and that's sometimes all it takes is just not making it a forefront of every conversation <laughs> I agree with that on our front. Um, we had a Delta, they weren't hiring, they don't hire a lot of women at the time. And we had a lot of women that they were hiring. And the big question was, well, we, we have babies and we need maternity shirts. They're like, oh, can't you just get a bigger shirt? I'm like, no, because I'm 
not that big. It's a baby. It's, you know, it's not this big. It's just a little bump. And they, it's what Lindsay said. They just didn't even think about it. Not enough people had even brought it to the table to be an issue. And so when we started talking about it, they're hiring more women, you know, they were dealing with, you know, our contract changes to where you were flying a little bit longer. We had Airbus that was added to the fleet after Northwest. So when I had my first daughter, I was on the 7-3, I can't pull that far into my belly on a crosswind landing because it's going to get stopped versus the Airbus. You could fly longer because you have a side stick. So there were different things that we were dealing with, but honestly, the conversation was, oh, we don't have maternity shirts? no. Oh, we don't have maternity pants? No. Well, what do you do? We figured it out, but could you help us? You know, so a lot of times it, it just wasn't conversations that were ever brought up. And as women, we just took it upon us to, I guess no one will help us. We'll figure it out when really we just never brought the question to the table. And there are ways to do it. I've, I've done it with other things. And you just get curious. You know, is, is there a reason we don't have maternity shirts? Who could we talk to about that? Oh, okay. Is there a reason I have a double breasted jacket and only comes in a men's size? Oh, Oh, okay. Just things that if you don't speak up, you're not going to get answers. So being an advocate for any change that you want in any capacity, you can do it professionally with style and grace. I always try to do that in every capacity. But like you said, we don't have to whine about it. Just I'm curious. So please provide some answers. Yeah. And then kind of going along with what um, they both said is um, kind of go from it in a, like a professional manner. I mostly went after things in like a safety perspective. Like I had mentioned before, they didn't have like latex gloves that would fit me. So I was like, you're not providing PPE for me. You know, I, I kind of went for the safety aspect that I'm like, you know, and then with her ripping her pants, <laughs> you know, if it's not fitting you appropriately, then you're, you're, you have more of like a trip hazard or something that can snag on it. And so, you know, kind of approach it that way too, if you don't want to come off as, you know, like you're whining or complaining about something. So just kind of find a different way to approach it. So like safety, everyone knows aviation. That's kind of the one big thing everyone wants to, you know, accommodate and help with, you know, be safe. So that's kind of the one way I normally went to stuff like, Hey, I can't reach anything in the hangar. It's not safe for me to just like start climbing on shelves or, you know, I need gloves in order to fuel and oil the aircraft or, you know, like I need a uniform. So that way one, it was, we were kind of in a secure location. So and everyone had to have badges and uniforms, you know, to know that you worked there and things like that, you know? So I kind of went after it in like a safety aspect, like, you know, Hey, you want me you want to show that I'm still part of this team as well. Like I need the uniform, you know, cause otherwise the contractors and, you know, the students and everything coming in aren't going to know that I'm part of this team and that I'm not like a visitor just coming by. So kind of go from it from different angles and, you know, like, like everyone mentioned, most of the time they just don't even know that these are problems or they don't notice these things. So just try and bring, bringing it up like that is probably the best way I, from my experience. And also add, if you give data, that helps. That's what we did with the maternity. It's like, this percentage of women is what was hired. This is the potential that could be on maternity leave. Why are we not supporting that? So when you give safety facts, you give data, you bring it to their attention in a very factual way versus an aggressive way or something that, oh, you need to fix this. It's just more of a, what can we do about this in that aspect? Because we're all professionals and we all need to work together. Absolutely. Um, at this point now, I'd like to start our um, the reception time because I know um, four o'clock people may have classes at four or what have you. Um, but um, if you don't need to leave right now, please stay. Um, do we have any last minute questions from anybody? No? Okay, I will tell you that we have food over here <laughs> and we also have, I know I push food everywhere we go. Um, and we also have drinks over there as well too. So please help yourself. All right, I'd like to, before we do anything, take a round of applause for all of our panelists. <laughs> And please use this time to come up. Maybe we can mingle and kind of go in the back a little bit or mingle around um, and ask them any one-on-one um, -on -one questions that you may have. And um, please, by all means, we're here to help each other. We're here to empower our students. And so if you um, have any last minute uh, words of advice that you want to give anybody and like, I don't know, a minute or less, what would you say? Like words, uh, sentence, um, advice. Jayla, we'll start with you. Um, I would just say, remember nobody comes out of, you know, I said this before, out of the womb, flying a plane or fixing a plane or whatever you do. So just be patient with yourself as you're doing, going through training and 
and trying new things and doing new careers? Uh, yeah, always keep a positive attitude, have the mindset that there's uh, always something, something to learn, something to grow, something you can get and, um, you know, learn from, from everyone and then uh, network. Aviation is very small. Networking is very important. Um, you'd be surprised who you run into later down the road that you might have just met for five minutes. Yeah, I was going to say what Lindsay said, but definitely, definitely, men, uh, not men, sorry. network, network, network is very, very important. You never know. You might think you might not need this person, but maybe down the road, opportunity, opportunity might present itself and you can go back to them. Um, definitely find a mentor, um, someone that can help you out making those big decisions or someone you can look up to, give you some inspiration. Um, and then also just uh, just stay true to yourself. You know, remember why you came into this um this career field and stay true to that and always be safe. Um, there's, there's no one path you can take. Your career can take you down like many different roads or different avenues. So just always be like open to all the different opportunities and things out there for you. So uh, looking around here, this, this is so great just to be back here and so much is done with this campus, but it just constantly reminds me time is going to fly. We are all already on a one stop nonstop flight and it's called life. So you have to decide either way, you're going to come back here in 10 years. You're going to come back here in 20 years. What do you want that life to look like? What do you want to be saying to the students around this campus? What do you want to have accomplished? When you start asking yourself these questions, you almost force yourself to fill in the gaps. This is where I want to be in five years. This is where I want to be in 10 years. The challenges won't matter because when it really matters to you, you'll find a way. If it doesn't matter, you'll make excuses. So just start setting goals and figure out where you want to be and ask yourself those hard questions. Awesome. Anybody here have questions or advice for us? Advice for your peers? No, you guys are quiet today. All right. Thank you again, everybody, so much, very much for all your time. Thank you again for coming today. And again, please stay, enjoy the refreshments, talk to our panelists.